Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Invase's first webinar of 2022, the year ahead for drainage service providers staying ahead of the game in a volatile market, presented by Dan Gardner from Kin Logistics Solutions. Now, before we get into the presentation, we have a quick poll question for our audience. So before we tell you what to be expecting in, um, in the year, I want to find out what you're expecting. Um, so if you can please select one of the followings. Uh, do you think that we'll be seeing even more disruptions and volatility this year? Do you think we're going to be seeing about the, the same as we had in 2021? Or do we all kind of take a breath and think that things are going to calm down a little bit? We'll give uh, give folks a few seconds here to, to get their votes in. Looks like we got about oh, just over half. Oh, they're, they're all flying in now. All right, give a couple more seconds here. All right, somebody push it over the 70% mark there. All right, there we go. Okay, we'll close the poll and share the results there. So looks like folks are expecting even more disruptions and volatility at 61% there. Uh, 36 of you say, oh, it's gonna be about the same and very few uh, <laughs> saying it's gonna calm down. So. Overall, the uh, the consensus is more kind of craziness in the future here, which kind of what we're we're expecting too. And thank you very much for that uh, for that feedback. Um, we can move to the next slide here, uh, where we can get into the agenda. We'll be covering a fair amount of ground in the webinar today. Uh, we'll start off with some introductions. Uh, Dan will then provide a market outlook for us. Uh, he'll then cover how the ocean freight market will affect drayage rates and expectations. He'll touch on what the 2021 Ocean Shipping Reform Act will do for you and how to create opportunities by managing your demurrage and detention. Uh, he'll then offer some tactical suggestions around labor and then how technology can help. Now for a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, our webinar is being recorded so you can watch it again after and we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar so please send those through using that chat box that we have. Uh, moving on from here, um, for those who don't know, we are in Vase, and while that name is new, you'll likely have heard or worked with one of our Dray Tech solutions that include CompCare, uh, GTG, InfoSight, and Profit Tools. Taken together, we are the largest and most innovative intermodal TMS provider, focused on creating a full intermodal ecosystem to digitize your drayage. Uh, move to the next slide. Um, Ultimately, what we're really most proud of though is how every day thousands of customers across North America use our solutions to really streamline their businesses, to achieve that extra quarter turn that gives them a leg up on the competition and ultimately puts a few dollars, a uh, few extra dollars in their pockets for the hard work that they do. Uh, and with that, I'll turn things over to Dan. All right, turn my camera on here you see me okay not th not that that matters but greetings everybody <laughs> we can see you <laughs> we can said, see you all righty brad said uh, my name is dan gardner and on behalf of both Invase and kin logistics solutions i also want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to to join us um, we have a lot of ground to cover to, as you saw on the agenda so i'll go through just a couple slides two minutes on an intro to kin logistics solutions and we'll get right down right down to business. So Kin Logistics Solutions, we are a strategic partner of Invase, and as you see in the first bullet point, we provide business process outsourcing services specific to the transportation and logistics industry, back office, offshore support. We'll talk more about the details of that in just one second. Uh, but, but Kin has operations in Karachi, Pakistan, but is actually a US corporation uh, registered and operating in the state of California. So we have business entities in, in both Pakistan and California. Uh, the company was actually launched, you'll note in the third bullet point, in the first quarter of 2020. And based on the success we've had predominantly offering back office services to the drayage industry, we have 40 associates servicing over 20, 20 customers. Last bullet here, Kin Pakistan and Kin USA are supported in the US by the LA-based supply chain consultancy Trade Facilitators Inc. That's my company. I represent Kin here in the United States on top of their corporate presence and offer support in terms of integrations, training, onboarding, et cetera, et cetera. We can move on from, 
from that. Um, as a quick mission statement, I won't read through the whole thing, but the, 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 the really the goal of KIN is, is to make its customers more competitive by providing back office services that complement their client facing activities. We're all about what we call logistics processing, logistics process outsourcing services. And that can include freight forwarding, certain elements of customs brokerage, and definitely, definitely port and rail drainage. The photos you see here are from the, the operation in Karachi. Uh, this is the founder of the company here, one of the co-founders. Uh, his name's Imran. I've known him for 20 years. We actually work together here in Southern California at DHL Global Forwarding. But great company, great environment to work in and, and a strong service-oriented corporate culture. Uh, last slide before we jump in. In terms of the drayage industry specifically, th these are some of the things that we engage in. We'll run through this very quickly. Should be very familiar to everyone online here today, but all facets of work order management, uh, terminal trace for certain. A lot of that is LA Long Beach, but can be others as well. Appointment setting for certain, demurrage and detention monitoring, uh, even yard management. Scanning and indexing specific to, to loads, customer report generation, and even things like a driver pay, some really deep back office stuff. And we'll quickly wrap up. As far as our drainage provider customers go, some of the benefits include, number one, uh, free up your U.S. teammates to focus on mission critical things like customer service and problem solving. We're not here to supplant anybody. We're here to complement the efforts of your people in the states. We have multiple shifts. There's an 11 hour time difference between the West Coast and Karachi, Pakistan. And that really offers certain advantages that I'll briefly elaborate on later on in the presentation. But essentially 24 hour coverage that gives access to up minute and accurate info, direct communication with assigned support agents by chat, email, Zoom, et cetera, and enhance productivity, both for you as well as the Kim team. So enough on that. <clears throat> Let's get down to, to business here. And what we're going to do in the next couple slides is provide a, a drayage outlook, port and rail drayage outlook, that at first glance you might say to yourself, well, this is pretty obvious. <laughs> Tell me something that we don't know. What we're really doing here is setting up the conversation and, and not so much point out some things that are that are obvious, but what you can do about them as the year unfolds. So that's the framework within which we're going to present this drayage outlook. So let's begin by saying, I think it's been well proven that supply chain disruptions and delays are going to be around for as long as, unfortunately, coronavirus is. We saw that in Vietnam, major shutdowns, uh, the port of Ningbo, major shutdowns, and as recently as a week or two ago, Tianjin. And, and you might say to yourself, well, what, what does that have to do with my business as a drainage provider? You know this. A lot of the, the merchandise is, is import oriented, export as well. But when something goes wrong upstream in a supply chain, it's going to find its way downstream, especially in the drainage space. A more local example of that, as recently a week ago, the 10% of the LA Long Beach port workforce was out sick. That's 800 out of 8,000 people on the docks in the offices. It has an impact on our business as drainage providers. Uh, without sounding like Mr. Doom and Gloom, there's a potential for a double whammy from coronavirus and climate change events. Uh, just as recently as November, uh, the port of Vancouver um, had some floods, very, very atypical out of season flooding that, that basically washed out rail capabilities that of course impacts the trade business. You add that to some pretty strict mandates in place for coronavirus in, in Canada and that creates challenges. That's just one example, but again, we don't want to be Mr. or Ms. Doom and Gloom here, but the possibility certainly exists. Uh, third bullet, needless to say, the wild card in all of this is continued consumer demand the contents of all those containers and 53 foot trailers that drainage providers are moving around. The, the insatiable demand for products by the US consumer. Who knows that, what's that going to look like when we get back to traditional back to school holiday, et cetera. There's just no way to predict that. But here's the thing, last bullet on this slide, regardless of 2022 consumer spending, it's going to take four to six months to clear up residual port and rail backlogs. Now, as recently as an hour ago, I, I was online at the Marine Exchange of Southern California, and according to them, I wrote it down, 88 ships 
either at anchor or at berth or loitering. That's a new term. I had never heard that. Ships are loitering now. That's a, a term they used for vessels that are floating around. Uh, 88 uh, with 31 at anchor. That seems to be an improvement, but it could change as we get into Chinese New Year. The Winter Olympics are starting in Beijing. A, a bunch of stuff going on there. The fact remains, whether you're in Detroit, Chicago, dealing with rail, drayage, import or export oriented, or ports, be it Savannah, Seattle, LA, Long Beach, it's going to take some time to clear this stuff out. Here's an important point that we'll, we'll elaborate upon in just a bit, because it's going to impact your business strategically and from a sales perspective as a drayage provider. Some ocean carriers are changing their strategies from NVOCC contracts working with freight forwarders to direct shipper agreements. And that could change the panorama for drayage providers depending on whether you as a drayage provider work with customs brokers and freight forwarders servicing them, who in turn service their customers, or you're dealing with direct shippers. More on that in just a bit. This is subtle, but important. Transload, that's a big deal. We'll talk more about that specifically as well. The stripping of ocean containers at facilities in close proximity to a port and distribution out to multiple facilities. The, the dray dynamic is different in a transload environment. That will definitely continue to grow. Export boxes will be scarce again. We all know that. Here's the most obvious one. Labor shortages will persist, but we're gonna look at it from a driver, company and owner operator, office and warehouse perspective and offer some tactics and suggestions on how to to deal with that i guess depending on how you look at it the second to the last bullet point could be good news or bad news shippers will be more open to considering new drayage providers looking for new solutions looking for ways to deal with the ongoing volatility that based on our poll result everyone believes is definitely going to be at least as bad if not worse and then technology, we'll talk about this at the end of the presentation, it's going to continue to change the game where visibility, interoperative, interoperability, and productivity really matter. We'll define what those terms mean as we move forward. But th this is what we think the outlook is going to be. Now, more importantly, what, what can companies do about it? So the title to this slide, and we're going to bring up a the second poll question, because it's indicative of, of, of what strategic plans drayage providers have for 2022, but we're going to talk about three facets of ocean freight, mostly import, but export too, and the impact it has on drayage rates, whether it's port drayage or conveyance to railheads, et cetera, et cetera. And the first one we're going to talk about is ports of discharge. So I'll run through this slide and then we'll put up the poll just to get a feel for what people are, are what they are in addition to the first poll question, what you think is going to happen, what are you going to do strategically in that environment? Let's run through this. As imp importers move away from discharge ports, speaking of imports now, multi-port coverage from drainage providers will be an advantage. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, forever, and I've been in California, I come from a freight forwarding and customs brokerage background, but, but I've been in California for 16 years now, and I've always heard about how BCOs, beneficial cargo owners, are, are going to get tired of the congestion and the, the goings on at LA Long Beach Port and start moving freight to places like maybe Houston, Savannah, New York, New Jersey, et cetera. That's what we're talking about here, because what's definitely happened. You can see it up in Oakland, even Vancouver, for that matter, to move goods on the rail across Canada and then down into Chicago, that BCOs, the actual shippers, are indeed moving away from discharge ports like LA Long Beach. So national drainage providers may or may not have an advantage, but here's the thing. In the sub bullet point here, congestion, and I put that in, in the air quotes there, and secondary ports will create its own challenges because within a year of the pandemic hitting you started hearing about carriers like cma and matson putting in sailings or moving sailings from los angeles long beach, long beach up to oakland well it wasn't a matter of weeks that oakland had its own congestion problems as recently as a week ago i saw a report and i, I had to chuckle a little bit charleston 
was, was inundated because they had seven ships waiting, waiting, uh, loitering to use that term from the, from the Southern California Marine Exchange. So it's almost like a whack-a-mole situation as volumes move around. As strange providers, we need to be able to deal with that. Second bullet, exporters, <coughs> excuse me, exporters are also looking for alternative ports of loading, which will impact port and rail drayage. Um, we as Ken, and certainly in Vase as well, see, see this a lot with drayage providers in Chicago, in Detroit, where their export customers are looking, and I put an example down here, instead of the traditional dray up to Chicago and put on a rail out to the West Coast for an export to, to Asia, as an example, that we've seen this, that, that companies are now drained down to St. Louis and railing from there. So obviously, and that's going out of Norfolk for European loads on the export side. So the ability to, to deal with those changes is, is important as well. And in the end, and we'll put up the poll in a second, for those companies that have national or certainly regional coverage, you have to have port and rail specific market knowledge from a capacity perspective, from a rate perspective, a driver pay perspective, et cetera. So based on that, Brad, maybe we can take 30 seconds, a minute, and put up the put up the poll real quick, please. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So we want to find out from our audience, um, you know, will you be expanding your current geographic coverage to offer uh, additional services to cover other ports or rail ramps in uh, 2022? So our options here, you know, yes, no, or maybe you're just kind of thinking about the idea. Give people a few more seconds here to, to get their votes in. Interesting numbers here, actually. All right, we'll give people, let's say, five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'll close the poll there and I'll share the results. So, Looks like about 45% of you are going to be expanding your coverage. Um, nope, 34% of you are, are sticking to where, where you're, um, you're currently servicing. Um, a good chunk, actually, 21% of you are, are thinking about expanding. So good to, uh, good to know. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'll hide the results and turn things back over to Dan. Yeah, thank you. And th th those are interesting. So uh, yes, you said 45, 34% sticking to their knitting if you will, in 21, still giving it some, some thought. So while there's a recognition of volatility, there, there's also a recognition that there might be some opportunities uh, within that volatility. So that'll, that'll, that'll guide the, the conversation a little bit further. So let's, let's move on. Now, the next point on ocean freight and the impact on drayage is NVOCC versus BCO. Lot, lots of alphabet soup there, but as I'm sure most everybody knows of NVOCC, that's a non-vessel operating common carrier. That's an ocean freight forwarder that contracts with steamship lines for space, turns around and resells that space. They oftentimes on behalf of their customers will contract with drainage companies to be part of an overall integrated portfolio. That's what we're talking about there versus BCOs, the actual shippers, beneficial cargo owners that go directly to the steamship lines to negotiate their contracts and in turn, in some instances, will negotiate their own agreements directly with drainage providers. This, this is an important consideration and in the observations, non-proprietary observations that we can make about our, the customers that, that we serve with at Kin as well as in Vase with, with with technology and back office support is that there's oftentimes a mix of so direct to shipper accounts, servicing and also servicing customs brokerage and forwarder accounts. Within that framework, if the ocean carriers move down market to pursue shippers directly, that's what we're talking about here. That will change the sales and operational tactics of drayage providers. And this has been in the trade news multiple, multiple times. We won't mention any names, but some of the bigger ocean carriers that there, there's news about them essentially trying to eliminate the middle person, meaning the NVOCC, and go down market to directly to shippers. Eliminating the middle person, basically. How that pans out remains to be seen, but it's definitely a trend. Most importantly, what does that mean to you? The second bullet is that this all means that small to medium-sized forwarders might, emphasis on might, get pushed out of the market. Um, 
I have my own opinions on that, but it, it, we, we could spend the rest of the webinar talking about it, so I won't go down that, down that path. But drainage providers that provide services to small to medium-sized folders or customs brokers, if that happens, what I just described, might lose business. Emphasis on might. So the fundamental question, and this is a strategic consideration for you all, and I'm sure you think about it all the time, who's my customer? You as the drainage provider, who is my customer? Is it the forwarder or customs broker that is operating on behalf of the BCO? Or are you contracting directly with BCO customers or is it a combination of the two? How you approach that strategically and from a sales and operations perspective is likely to be a little bit different. We'll talk a little bit more about those differences as we proceed. Just checking my my time here. Now, the third piece that we're going to talk about before moving on from the ocean freight market and its impact on drainage providers is this whole idea of transload. And just for clarification, I'm sure everybody knows what transload is, but essentially ocean containers, import containers uh, coming in, could be anywhere in, in the US or Canada, or anywhere around the world, basically, that the contents of those containers are stripped at a location in close proximity to a port of discharge, and then on forwarded to multiple locations around the country. Uh, actually, the image you see on the right is a transload facility in the Carson Wilmington area of, of SoCal, where there are many transload facilities. I took this picture, uh, albeit a couple of years ago, and you can see, for example, a 45 ocean contain 45 footer um, that I can assure you was being stripped and loaded out into 53 foot rail trailers. So for the drainage provider, you have the port drainage and the rail drainage, some real opportunities there. Here's why it's going to continue to grow. Ocean carriers never liked having containers go inland. Pre-pandemic, they, they didn't like it because they had to reposition those containers. And because the US imports way more than in exports, they were oftentimes repositioning empty containers. That was a big expense for the carriers. So given the increase in rates where the real money in the ocean carrier business, and everyone's heard about this, are the import boxes coming into the country. Crazy rates, you know, 20,000, 25,000 for a 40 footer coming out of Shenzhen, going into LA Long Beach. The carriers don't want to uh, diddle or futz around with containers. They want to get them back to origin. So they're, they're encouraging importers to terminate containers at the port of discharge, which in turn would, might compel a BCO, an importer, to engage in Transload. Transload has been around forever. When I first moved to Cali 16 years ago, it was well entrenched even, even then. But from a drainage perspective, drain boxes, ocean containers, like a 45 footer we see here, to a Transload facility is different from going to a DC or a fulfillment center. And, and I think what I'm going to characterize is, is endemic of ports around the country, but definitely LA Long Beach, the facilities, the transload facilities are closer, but they're much smaller. You're not going to find a half a million square foot or a million square foot distribution center close to the ports of LA Long Beach. Those are out in the Inland Empire, 50, 75 miles away. So that's just one difference in and of itself. Within that framework, yard management is key. Whether you're a drainage company that is bringing containers, full containers in and empties out to a third party transload facility, or you're operating your own, the FIFO method, first in, first out, as it relates to, to container management and the ability to manage a yard, really, really quite important. I'll talk about more about that in just a second. When you think about it, bringing containers in and out of a transload facility, dual transactions are a must to the extent, for example, that the terminals in LA Long Beach are doing dual transactions and what the availability of appointments are, what, what have you. But asset management, meaning managing your equipment, your chassis, your power units, and your most important asset, your drivers, become, can be a little tricky in a transload environment. Tran dual transactions re really are a must to the benefit of the customer more than anything. One thing I learned when I first came here uh, 16 years ago is that demurrage and detention can get out of control quickly. Uh, I came here working for Excel Global Logistics and I, I just remember this, one of the first issues I dealt with was a transload facility being run 
by that organization. Uh, Excel has since been acquired by DHL Global Forwarding, but we had a pretty substantial detention bill going on uh, for a specific customer in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that, that we as the service provider, the transload operator, were being held to account for, as in we were getting blamed for the detention. So th this is something that, that stuck in my head as it related to the drainage component, the transload component, and yard management. It just, it was my literally my first experience here in Southern California in the forwarding space. But we all know that demurrage and detention can get out of control quickly. And then the last point here is that drainage providers, if you have a yard and or transload capabilities, it's likely that you'll have a competitive advantage. Even if you don't do transload, um, one of the acronyms that, that has been really, really put to good or bad use in the drainage environment, and we see this as Ken because these are the things that we do, is PTY, pull to yard, where a drainage provider is helping their customer to avoid demurrage on a terminal by getting a container off a terminal, even if it doesn't have anywhere to go. Pull it to the yard and then move it from there. When you have those capabilities, either your own or through a third party and transload, because of the po growing popularity of transload, could be a good advantage for you as a drainage provider. All righty, let's continue on. Let's get to some of the really boring stuff that, that has a very, very big impact potentially on drainage providers. And this is the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, or OSRA, as it's called, of 2021. And basically, if you're not too familiar with that exciting legislation, it's, it's just that. It's a proposed law, <coughs> excuse me, that basically says, the, or that addresses unjust or unreasonable, and I put those in quotations because those words are used in the legislation, demurrage and detention charges from carriers and or marine terminal operators. And you all as drainage providers know that you can get stuck in the middle. I, I alluded to this a moment ago. You can get stuck in the middle pretty quickly as it relates to who, who's going to get blamed for dem demurrage and detention. But essentially, what OSRA, or at least this aspect of OSRA 2021 does, is it compels the carriers and or the marine terminal operators to justify in writing what their de demurrage and or detention charges are. The act also attempts to enhance access to export boxes. I have no idea how, how the, the government, the Federal Maritime Commission to be specific, is going to address that issue. Totally, that's a subject that we could go on for hours. But as I said a moment ago, as it relates specifically to demurrage and detention, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, we see this in our third bullet point, puts the onus for proving reasonable charges on the carrier slash MTO. And it's up until now, or, or at least when this law goes into effect, the onus has been on the BCO and more than likely their drainage provider to prove that due to circumstances outside their control, they couldn't get an appointment. There, there, weren't, there wasn't any equipment, any chassis from a, from a chassis pool things outside their control that they shouldn't be charged for demurrage and detention. So it's a reversal of responsibility. But here's some of the bad news. OSRA has passed the House, but not the Senate. So it's bogged down in a political environment, and it's not, who goodness knows how that's going to proceed. But to that end, what you see on the right-hand side here, in the spirit of being thorough, we actually went to the website of Congress. You can see it in very small font up here, but it's the status of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. And you can you can follow it so you can see it was introduced past the House, and that's that's where it's at right now. It has to get all the way to over here. So how long that takes, I wouldn't get my hopes up about the implementation of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2021, I guess is what we're trying to say. But but here's a dose of reality. And I'd be interested in people's opinions on this as well. You can chat in your comments or questions or what have you. But I think, and this is a well-intentioned act, the FMC is trying to help. Let's acknowledge that for certain. But it just seems that out in the real world, first of all, the practicality of enforcing the reasonableness of demurrage and detention charges remains to be seen. Let's think about demurrage for a second out in the real world, and so we can use LA Long Beach as an example. <clears throat> 
if there is demurrage, you know, usually what, four days free time, usually for, for, you know, standard operating procedure here in LA Long Beach, and you get out to six or seven days, and the circumstances around that demurrage were outside of the BCO's control or the, or the drainage company, their control, basically what you're doing is taking screenshots of, of the, the terminal website that you couldn't get an appointment and just trying to prove that you shouldn't be subject to these charges. But but here's the deal. If you want to get a container in the heat of the moment, it's back to school. Your customer needs that container to get into a distribution center and, and sell all of that merchandise. You know as well as I do, you have to pay all the charges before you can even get an appointment. So how, my question is, it, it's rhetorical at this point, how is that going to work out in the real world? It's well-intentioned, but the practicality of it remains to be seen. So look at it this way. A second bullet, drainage providers, that can provide container specific detention, demurrage and detention charges that are outside of the control of the BCO will have a competitive advantage. And these are some of the things that and the Invase technology enables and that KIN as BPO service providers executes upon going on the terminal sites, taking those screenshots, lining up those screenshots with specific files to do just that. You, you can do that consistently, you're going to have a competitive advantage in what otherwise would be a pretty uncomfortable situation. But to do that, drainage companies need a combination of technology, manpower, and operational know-how. Quick excerpts, just to, to prove a point of what we're saying here. This legislation is 40 pages long. Uh, I read the whole thing. It has other stuff in there other than detention and demurrage. But uh, if you have, I say this facetiously, but not really, if you have any type of sleeping disorder, uh, read through this 40 pager and by the time you're on page five, you, you'll, be, you'll be sleeping comfortably. But we did go through and point out what those key points are as it relates to drainage providers. So read this one on the left-hand side, certification. What does that mean? Well, failure of a common carrier, meaning steamship line marine terminal operator, to include a certification alongside any demurrage or detention charge shall eliminate any obligation of the charged party to pay the applicable charge. If there's demurrage, if there's detention, the party levying that charge has to be able to prove the reasonableness of those charges. It's referred to as certification, it has to be in writing. So should this law go into effect at some point in the future, not only are drainage providers on behalf of their customers in a position to prove that certain charges were not reasonable, they have to be able to archive and, and keep a record of the ones that were and be able to house these certifications because the question on the billing will eventually come up. Lower right-hand corner, and we'll, we'll, we'll leave OSRA for another day, but this is talking about the carriers now shall bear the burden of establishing the reasonableness of any demurrage or detention charges which are the subject of any complaint proceeding challenging a common carrier or marine terminal operator demurrage or detention charges. Here's the problem. If you read through the rest of the legislation, they have yet to deter to make a definition, a specific legal definition of what reasonableness means. In fact, the carriers, marine terminal operators, should this legislation be passed, they have a grace period, I want to say, 30 if not 60 days to write up what the definition of reasonable means. This, this is important. It's not going to impact you today, but you need to be aware of it moving forward. Okay, let's move on and I will take a, a deep breath as we proceed. I just want to check our panel here. Oh, good, good, good observation. I'll bring it up now because it's, it's on OSRA 2021. A note from one of our attendees, Senate should introduce a comparable bill as soon as next week. Uh, that is absolutely true. I failed to mention that. Thank you for bringing it up. So you have this, the House comes up with their legislation, and then the Senate comes up with their own. So now they're going to get into an internal beef about who's is better, and it's just, going to, it's just going to make things take longer, basically. But thank you for making that observation. That, that's a very good one. I'm glad I, I'm glad I checked. All righty. Let me close that box up so I can see what's going on here. <clears throat> All righty, let's move on to dealing with detention and demurrage, but potentially as a drainage provider, creating competitive advantage through how you manage detention and demurrage on behalf of your forwarder slash broker customers or your direct BCO customers. 
we've seen this over and over again. I, I experienced in my own forwarding and customs brokerage endeavors. Oftentimes, the drainage provider is the best line of defense for BCO to avoid demurrage and or detention charges because they're in the thick of the fight. If they're using the technology correctly, if they're making use of their own know-how, we're checking this stuff out every single day and it applies to both port and rail drainage. You can operate on behalf of the customer to minimize or hopefully, well, emphasis on hopefully, eliminate demurrage, getting containers off of a terminal in detention, getting them back. And, and here's the stark financial reality that you, you know this, <clears throat> the drainage provider has a vested interest in managing detention and demurrage because when the finger pointing starts, to be quite honestly, it's, it's musical chairs on who's going to get stuck with a $5,000 detention charge. And unfortunately, sometimes that finger gets pointed at the drainage company, whether it's reasonable or not. So it's in the best interest of the customer, most importantly, and in the best interest of the drainage provider to really aggressively attack detention and demurrage. <coughs> Excuse me. So for import boxes, second bullet point, the ability to monitor container availability, payment of legitimate charges to make sure a container is available to even get an appointment, things like last free day, terminal schedules, and appointments are key. We'll talk more about that in just one second. And, but to do that, you have to coordinate with the shipper, the BCO, I should say, the customs broker that's generating and sending you a delivery order, and the destination site to, as to where that container or containers are going is mission critical. So it's not only internal management, but coordination with the folder and broker, getting the DO, making sure all the charges are paid, making the appointment, all of that good stuff. Move on here. Okay. A combination, continuing on with detention and demurrage, a combination of technology, asset management, power units, chassis, and that most important asset, the, the people that, that run them, operational know-how and hours of operation is what we think creates competitive advantage for drainage providers specific to demurrage and detention. Things like automated receipt of DOs from brokers, uh, work order management from, from the time a work order is received via an EDI transmission, for example, into an Advase environment. Terminal specific status updates and, and the knowledge on how to navigate around all of the terminals, 12 of them here in Southern California. Immediate appointment making, indexing of detention and demurrage issues, protests, et cetera. Let, let me describe a situation to you as it relates to creating competitive advantage in the detention and demurrage area. Uh, specific to work order and appointment management at the ports of LA Long Beach. And this is a combined effort of the Invase technology and the back office services that Kin Logistics Solutions provide. O obviously here in SoCal, you have to have appointments at the terminals. That's empties, returned, pickup of full loads, dual transactions, who's doing what. And, and every terminal has their own gig in terms of you know, what they're doing on any given day. But in speaking, with all of the drainage providers that we work with here in Southern California, one of the biggest challenges, biggest issues is, is when the appointments open up. And it's in some instances, 4.30 in the morning on a Monday where I know people, they've told me the, the stories locally that they're up at four o'clock in the morning, all amped up to get, on, get online like they were trying to get tickets to an Adele concert. And then it opens up, but it's 4.30 in the morning, only to have those appointments changed or canceled later on. This, this, this is not me making up a hypothetical. This, this is real stuff. So you have the technology in place, to, to the interoperability in place between the assay technology and the various sites for appointment making. But what the value that Kin Logistics Solutions has brought to the table is, is related to that time difference. So if it's 4.30 in the morning here, it's going to be, there's a 11 hour time difference dur during non daylight saving time. So it's going to be 3.30 in the afternoon for them. Way ahead of the game in appointment making, work order management, where a lot of this stuff is already done when people are showing up. 
the following day, whether it's Monday morning or what have you. So in the case of a Monday morning appointment opening, what Ken is doing is working Sunday. They're going in on Sunday night at 5.30 in the afternoon, their time, that 11 hour time difference. They're there to op get on the site, make the appointments and at least get out in front of this stuff before it becomes an issue. When people come in Monday morning, a lot of their work has been taken care of and they can focus on customer service, resolving issues, more strategic and even developmental activities. We do that today, that's real. It's a combination of the Invase interoperability as well as the time difference advantage and the fact that we work seven days a week, 22 hours a day at Ken. That's for real. All righty. Doing okay time-wise. Starting to, to wind things down a little bit. Tactics for dealing with labor shortages, employee retention, and remote work. This is the big one. <clears throat> and what we'll make some pretty obvious statements here. Labor shortages will continue throughout 2022. But breaking it down by office, warehouse, company drivers, and or owner operators from a, having a strategy for each facet of the business is really what we're emphasizing here. Because the the, the motivations of people might be different in a driver environment, in, in an owner operator versus company driver environment versus an office environment. So we're breaking it down a little bit. And what's come to be learned, and I think this has been the case forever for people, but definitely in the pandemic era, is that in an office environment, money is really important. Let's, let's, let's not fool ourselves about that. But over time, it's not everything. And especially, I, I hear this a lot, uh, and not just in drayage, in, in my freight forwarding relationships, carrier relationships, customs brokerage, actual shippers, it, it's what people aren't talking about. And it's, it's honestly, it's a mental health issue. Pe people are just burning out 60, 70 hours a week for two years. I, I can't tell you how many stories I've, I've talked to people directly about people with 10 years experience with a company. Seven, another one, someone told me over the weekend, 17 years, heavy duty, experienced operator, couldn't take it anymore. <clears throat> this is real. Mental health is real in terms of burnout and, and other facets of, of mental health. But work-life balance, meaning if you work 80 hours a week for two years, something's going to go off the rails. You have to have a balance between the two recognition within the organization for all of your efforts and, and not just monetary recognition. Something as, as simple as a thank you go, goes a long way. And managerial support, meaning you have enough people and solid technology that people aren't hobbled from right out of the gate, <clears throat> that they can get in there and do, make their best effort because they know they're being supported from both a headcount and a technology perspective. So, but thinking about drayage, drayage companies should consider a long-term approach to remote work for office professionals. Now, I don't want to encourage or discourage people in any direction, but I think, I hope what we can all agree upon is that some elements of remote work are here to stay. <clears throat> in fact, I heard, I think it's amusing that the people that told me these stories don't find it very funny, but companies, not drage companies, uh, actually large forwarders and customs brokers that I'm friendly with and, and talk to, uh, telling me stories of, of, you know, they'll make the big proclamation to their office people, oh, we're, we're coming back to the office. And more than one instance where people are saying, well, I'd love to come back to the office in Los Angeles, but I moved to Phoenix during the pandemic and I'm not coming back. So how do you deal with those things? How do you recruit new people that have it in their minds from the get-go that they might be willing to do a hybrid some days in the office, some days at home or purely remote. That there's, there's an element of permanence to, to remote work that really has to be considered. So you need strategies, policies, procedures and technology, especially for remote workers to support remote teammates. Uh, if I had a dollar for every Zoom meeting that I've been on in the last two years, that's pretty basic technology, but it's, it's pretty important stuff. How about things like onboarding new employees who from day one never had the advantage of being in an office, being with their teammates, participating in, in the development of a corporate culture? Things as simple as, are you, are you going to require people to use their own computer equipment when you hire them to work remotely? Or are you going to send them a, a, a bling box, as it's called, 
with their laptop, you know, the coffee cup, welcome to the team, et cetera. Might, might sound kind of silly, to be honest, of the bling box, but in, in today's world, especially for younger workers coming into the workplace, this stuff means a lot. Moving on to drivers, company drivers. Um, one thing that I've learned because I pay attention to this stuff is that signing bonuses aren't enough. I, I can remember, and I spend a lot of time in, in Wilmington and Compton and Rancho Dominguez and Carson, drainage providers, transload people. You can't throw a rock for the last three years seeing a signed signing bonus. And it started out at 2000, then it was up to 3000. And this isn't proprietary information. All you have to do is drive by these facilities and you can see the sign. Drainage drivers, 3000 signing bonus. I saw one right before Christmas in Wilmington, right behind the trade pack terminals, $5,000 signing bonus. So it's almost an arm, arms race if you think about it, but signing bonuses, they're good, but they aren't enough. Basic stuff that you know about quality of equipment that drivers are, are using. And of course, the, the ports have certain criteria, more from an environmental perspective, but quality of equipment matters. Obvious stuff, desirable loads in multiple terms. And then this might be more applicable to owner operators, but a consideration nonetheless, a consideration for the driver's home base. And where do they live in, in relative to the yard and where the equipment is. And are they going to end their day in Nevada on, on a, or up in Victorville, to, to use an example of LA Long Beach, this, this stuff matters. So the ability to dispatch with consideration in mind for people is important. What else? <clears throat> and then we'll move on from, whoops. Whoops, I bounced ahead too far. We're almost finished here. Talking about owner operators. Here in California, uh, Assembly Bill 5 will dramatically change the owner-operator relationship. Um, I'm not a lawyer, certainly not qualified, nor would I ever attempt to dispense legal advice, but th this has to do, if you're outside of California, with, with how owner-operators may or may not be considered employees of an organization. So how that dynamic works and the technology that is used to manage that relationship becomes really, really important. In that owner operator environment rates and bonuses are important but not everything that there are scenarios at least in socal but other places around the country too new york new jersey where a bonus is offered to to take a take a load basically how do you manage that from a driver settlement perspective the technology has to be there to support that and the ease of executing those activities has to be there too Desirable loads, yeah, it's a given, but difficult to dispatch. But here's an important one, and, and I've seen this and observed this directly. Ease of doing business matters to owner operators. And what we're talking about here is a simple process for submitting billing paperwork, that driver settlement, how accurate the payouts are, and, and the timeliness of payouts. That's attractive to owner operators. And then again, beginning and ending the day close to home, Big plus, but you have to have the dispatch know-how and the technology to support that. All right, second to the last slide here. <clears throat> Deploying technology for enhanced customer service and operational efficiencies. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Carriers, ocean rail terminals, customs brokers, forwarders, airlines, everybody is up their game technologically, especially from a visibility perspective. That's all you hear now is visibilities visibility, I should say, drainage providers need to do the same. And in evaluating technology, TMS specific to, to drainage, you need to be thinking about the ease with which EDI transmissions can be received, electronic data interchange, a more updated technology, APIs, application program interfaces, where one piece of software can communicate or have an interface with the other. Uh, webhooks, is the ability to constantly be pinging another piece of software like a terminal operation for updates on container traces. A, a webhook, an API is essentially a phone call between two systems. That's an analogy, but that's pretty much what it is. A webhook is a constant phone call, constantly calling, getting updates all the time. You wanna be working with technology that has that capability. But other things like appointment apps, we used LA Long Beach, there's 12 different ones. For each terminal, last free day management, equipment optimization, driver management we spoke of, and of course, customer report writing.
But as a piece of advice, as, as you, and this is objective advice, as you evaluate technology, drayage TMS technology especially, look at it from several perspectives. The operational capabilities. Does it have what it takes for me as a drayage provider and my people to run our business in an integrated fashion? Interoperability. That means the ability to communicate, be it through EDI, APIs, and or webhooks with other systems of players in the supply chain. That's what we mean by interoperability. You absolutely have to have that. The productivity component, does it make us as an organization more productive? And in the end, although the customer might not see it, how does that impact the end customer experience? Appointments are done in a timely fashion. Minimal demurrage and detention. All of those things really matter. So this is the last, the last slide. But this combining technology asset, asset management and operational support for optimal service le levels, this, this is a Venn diagram, but the importance of technology, we just went through that, functionality, interoperability, efficiencies, UI is the user interface, how easy is it for our people in the drainage operation to use the system, and the U UX is the user experience, ultimately the customer and how they benefit from that technology, how you as a drainage provider manage your assets, be they power units, chassis, a yard if you have one, and a building if you're offering transload, to go back to that storyline. And then the op support, be it work order management, tracing, appointment making, report, gen, and the impact on the customer. What we are saying here, that the, the intersection, the, the Venn diagram center, resides where the Invase technology and Kin's BPO services really come together to, to enhance your performance and ultimately your customer's experience as well. And we found this to be true, not because we say so, but because our customers say so. All right, so that's it, Brad. If you want to, a um, cu couple minutes left, and I'll, I'll stay on. Yeah, for, a no, couple that, extra minutes to answer any questions. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we've had a few that have come in, but uh, actually, before we open the floor to, to everyone's questions, there we have two for you. Um, so we'll quickly launch our full aware. Um, just want to find out for our audience members here, would you like to learn more about how Kin can help you grow your business in 22 or 2022? Uh, you heard Dan describe a bit of the capabilities there, what can help, but um, let us know and uh, we could reach out after the webinar to uh, people a couple, couple seconds here to respond. Yeah, while we're doing so, that, Brad, I, I was just reading up that, that someone just passed this along. 15,000 signing bonus and still can't get get drivers. So Yeah, you're saying there's a half right there. That's, that's a tough I, one. I thought five. I, I saw five, as I said, in, in uh, Wilmington, but uh, 15,000 um, and still can't get drivers. Um, that's alarming. That's, yeah. All right, we're going to close that poll. Um, and then just one more quick one before we get into the questions. Would you like to learn how Invase can help you grow your business in 2022? Uh, it could be leveraging some of the different technologies uh, that, that Invase has. Um, I think a lot of folks on here are currently using the, the CompCare platform. Um, so, you know, there's a, that one, obviously, and uh, as well as the, the few others that we had talked about, Profit Tools, uh, GTG. Um, and yeah, just let us know, and then we can be following up afterwards to see how we may be able to help out. All right, I think most people have voted. We'll give a quick countdown here. Five, four, three, two, one. And right thanks, everyone. And uh, of course, you can always reach out afterwards, too, to, to get in touch with us. So I'm going to close that poll. We'll get the uh, question slide up here, and we'll get right into some of the questions that have come in. Uh, so someone had asked, um, and I think you've alluded to a lot of these already here, Dan, but maybe if you could say, you know, what are the, the biggest opportunities for a drayage carrier in 2022? Yeah, well, I'm the eternal optimist. Um, not having spent time in forwarding and customs brokerage and worked as a in, in the drayage space as well. So, so I think uh, volatility, uh, creates opportunities. As I said earlier, uh, companies are definitely uh, interested in hearing about new opportunities, uh, new companies, and it, that can be a plus. If you're the one getting the new business, it can be a minus. If you're the one losing 
business to, to someone that built a better mousetrap. So, so the, 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 I always remember someone told me that the symbol in Mandarin for danger and opportunity are the same, that pictograph that, that the Mandarin language uses. So, so I, I think that there are opportunities, but proceed with caution. Uh, we had a question come in uh, here from Tammy saying, how can we review the recorded webinar here to show others? Uh, I can answer this one, Tammy. Um, we will be sending out the recording link uh, to everybody that, that's, that RSVP'd here. So you will be getting a recording link, I'd say within the, within the week, um, hopefully within before the end of the week, but um, it might take some time as we just do the final edits and things like that. Um, somebody has also asked expectation. Oh, this is probably a hot topic too. Expectations for fuel prices. Well, as someone who drives around and, and burns on leaded gas, I'm, I'm hoping that they go down because here in SoCal, it depends on where you go, but you're looking at five bucks a gallon. Of course, that's unleaded, not not diesel. Um, but goodness, with, with supply chain inflation, um, disruption, some of the things going on geopolitically around the world. Um, my answer is, I don't know, but I'd be pretty surprised if, if it went down dramatically for, for all of those as well as other reasons. Just that whole dynamic of supply chain inflation, basically, and people passing on additional costs and, and, and along it goes into this upward spiral. So I'd be surprised if it went down dramatically. Yeah, uh, definitely an opportunity there to find some kind of fuel programs or things like that. <laughs> Good job. Keep an ear out for here. Yeah, I would say, uh, uh, obviously, the, the the issue of empty miles. You know, bobtailing all of this business. Um, that that has an impact on fuel and the overall efficiencies and profitability of the the drainage organization too. For sure, so, if you're able to leverage the, the technology to get. Sorry. Precisely. Um, all right, I didn't, somebody's asking what what kind of size of organization is Kin best suited to serve. Oh boy, what kind of organization size? So typically, uh, because I know every client that, that Ken has and work with them directly, um, definitely both rail and port drayage, because we have clients all around the country. I, I mentioned Detroit, also Columbus, Houston, Chicago, for sure, um, the major ports. So functionally, port and rail drayage, uh, both import and export, size-wise, it seems organizations, and I won't get into sales numbers, but in, in the office, when you're upwards of north of a dozen people that are multitasking, because it's not just the number of people, it's what they're doing, um, and that work-life balance equation, when you get up north of 12, 15 people that are multitasking, uh, that, that's where we can really bring some, some good value from relieving some of that workload, complementing the efforts of the people in the U.S. And, and given that time difference, when people come in in the morning, they're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Um, someone that's asking, asking, thank you, Tammy, for this one. Will a representative be at the uh, ComCare conference in May in uh, California? Um, and yeah, we, Dan, I've been chatting about that. I think Kim, uh, you guys are, are slotted to be a part of the uh, the Invasa user conference there in uh, in May, so. We look forward to, to I, I look forward to actually meeting Dan in person there. <laughs> so that'll, that'll yeah, be same. Yeah. Um, same. What, what's the, um, I, I love this, I know we're out of time, but I love this IHOP commercial. Uh, everybody could use a pancake. I don't know if you've seen that one, you know, after the two years of the pandemic. Mm, um, yes. every, everybody could use a little socializing and maybe a, a Coca-Cola or a glass of wine and just, uh, just hang out for a bit. So everybody can use a pancake or, or a Budweiser, depending on what your <laughs> preference might be. Exactly, exactly. Um, someone uh, else is asking, in terms of customers to go after, do you think it's better to service forwarders and custom brokers or go directly after importers? Oh, there's another one. Um, well, there's a couple of dynamics in that equation because, I, well, the short answer is, to diversify your risk, uh, to, to pursue both. But the, the danger, and I used to see this in freight forwarding uh, in, in this working with the steamship lines as well, is that you don't want to pull an end around on your forward or broker customer and approach their customer directly. 
basically back selling. We, that's what we used to call it in, in the forwarding industry. But obviously, when when you work directly with a BCO, um, there there's a middle person element that isn't there from a pricing perspective. So you you might be a little bit more competitive. You can manage the relationship more directly as well. On the other hand, and uh, forwarders and customs brokers have lots of customers that they could turn you on to. So I think a balance between the two is probably a good approach. Um, we got a couple more questions. They're slowing down a little bit here. Uh, even yeah, with sure. Osra, uh 2021 making terminal operators prove their demurrage and uh, detention charges, do you think that drainage companies will still have to prove things like no appointments were available before the last free day? Yes, I do. Um, so OSRA, as we saw, um, made it through the House, but not through the Senate. The Senate has their own bill. OSRA allows for up to 120 days implementation time. So in 2022, I, I wouldn't get my hopes up about OSRA in the first place. Um, let, let's assume that it does pass or some iteration thereof does pass. It comes down to this whole issue of what's reasonable. And although OSRA calls upon the carrier and the marine terminal operator to prove that their charges are legit, it's still a good idea for the drainage provider to be able to prove that they're not legit. Again, going on terminal sites, taking screenshots of no appointments or you know not accepting full loads or whatever the case may be. So I, I think, yeah, that regardless of what happens with OSRA 2021, Take that proactive approach and put yourself in a position to defend the interests of your customers, be they the forwarder broker or the BCO. Nice, thank you, Ben. Um, and I think this is our last question, unless we get Flurry coming in or something like that. But uh, what other ports are seeing growth in Transload? <laughs> um, well, I mentioned Oakland um, and, and traditional ports too, because this isn't the first time that, that, that BCOs have looked for alternatives to, to LA Long Beach. Uh, Savannah has grown dramatically and I've been on those terminals uh, a, a couple of times and, and seen the growth in distribution facilities, the bigger ones that are further out from the port, but also the Translo, the smaller 50,000 square foot, you know, 20 odd door Translo facilities around it. So definitely Savannah, little, Charleston action, you know, the Carteret area in, you know, New, Jer New York, New Jersey, Port Complex, uh, Seattle. So I think those ones would be primary. And in Houston as a port is, is going after that business too, a as a port promoting their transload ecosystem and how they can, they can service that. Uh, well, it looks like we are, uh, well, we bumped over time here now. So thank you everybody for sticking around. Um, and that was the last question we had come in. So if you do have additional folks or additional ideas or questions that you would like to ask, um, contact information is on the screen there. Um, and I just like to take this moment then to, to thank Dan for, for his great presentation um, and to all of you who attended today. Uh, we wish you a great rest of your week and ultimately a, a healthy and prosperous 2022. Thanks all. Absolutely. See you again next time. Thanks, Brad. Thank you guys. Thank you.